Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. In the build-up to WrestleMania 37, there have been reports that Vince McMahon isn't Edge's biggest fan, despite booking him to win the Royal Rumble, allegedly complaining that Edge looks too old. Which is why WWE have just released Edge. April Fools! That was an April Fools! They totally April Fools to you! But in a new interview with Sportskeeda's Wrestling Unscripted, John Cena's father, John Cena Senior, that's hard to say, revealed that McMahon's frustration with Edge goes back at least a decade and a half. During Edge's feud with John Cena Jr., heading into SummerSlam 2006, Edge had an angle where he slapped his dad, which Cena Senior has confessed McMahon thought it was the worst thing in the world. But despite that, WWE replayed that angle constantly, with Cena Dad calling it a Hall of Fame slap. Speaking of having heat with WWE, Caruso alert! Charlie Arnold, former Charlie Caruso, recently announced that she has signed with ESPN full-time after recently leaving WWE. Before this was announced, many sites reported she had backstage heat in the company, where she would be late to interview segments with the likes of Sheamus and Randy Orton. This behaviour supposedly led to her being taken off TV. Caruso has denied this, though, in an interview with TV Insider. The contract was coming up. Instead of renewing, I'm moving on. Everyone is going to have their own opinions regardless. I never had any issues while I was at WWE. Nothing bad happened. As far as I'm concerned, I'm leaving on a positive note and beginning what I believe to be the next step in my career. The current WWE plan is to have Caruso return in 10 years' time and win the Royal Rumble to main event WrestleMania. April Fools! I April Fools to you again! I saw the look on your face, YouTube commenter. I am so good at this! In not a joke story about a creepy clown, Ringside News is reporting the WWE creative team have pitched for Alexa Bliss to start wearing a mask for her partnership with the Crispy Fried Fiend. The original plan was apparently for her to debut the mask at January's Royal Rumble, but the idea reportedly is still on the table, meaning we could see her debut one soon for the Fiend's WrestleMania match against Randy Orton. Before two nights of May, though we've got two nights of NXT TakeOver. Two more matches were confirmed for Stand and Deliver! Whoa, whoa, whoa! On last night's Go Home show, with Pete Dunne facing Kushida on night one, and Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart facing The Way for the women's tag team titles on night two, completing a five-match card for each night. Chopper Pete and Tempest will be doing live reactions for both nights of the show, as well as a full podcast review on Friday over on our Wrestle Talk podcast channel. So make sure to subscribe there because they'll also be heading up the new weekly NXT review podcast now the show has moved to Tuesday nights. But to make sure those reviews stick around, you need to watch them. Otherwise, I'll scrap them for AEW Dark reviews. That's another April Fools. I'm never going to review that show. I fooled you with my bias. But speaking of AEW, it's Thursday. You know what that means. My review of last night's Dynamite in about five minutes. Beat still my late noughties TNA fanboy heart because Dynamite opened on Christian Cage's first proper in-ring singles match in seven years, facing off against his old Impact alumni Kaz. I love this match. I think everyone's been a bit down on Christian's return just because AEW arguably overhyped his signing, but it really is something to be excited for and this match showed why. Kaz worked as an arrogant heel and really took the majority of the match, really leaning into the idea of Christian's seven years of ring rust. But he's not just going to outwork everyone, he's going to outgrit everyone too. And Ragdoll Cell. Out Ragdoll Cell Everyone will be his next t-shirt. His near defeats and passing out spots really pulled me in. So much so, there was an actual part of me that thought Christian might lose his return and debut match. He won just inside the 20 minute time limit with a kill switch. Darby Allen took his dad's sting to throw money off a bridge in his latest short film about how money isn't everything, Matt Hardy. There's also feelings too. QT Marshall didn't get an entrance for his match against Cody, leaning in to his brewing tension in the Nightmare Family faction. This was very much a settle it in the family match, a similar code of honour to the heel in a circle, just a babyface version, with Arn Anderson as the special guest enforcer and Nightmare Family recruits around the ring. 
all 928 of them. Even though QT cynically went for Cody's arm, Rhodes easily stayed in control, so QT decked Arn Anderson for the DQ. QT's selling of immediate remorse was really interesting, but then it became apparent he wasn't mourning for what he'd done, it was for what was about to happen. Nick Comaroto, Aaron Solo, and Anthony Ogogo turned on the rest of the Nightmare family in a great beatdown angle, where Dustin Rhodes managed to bleed before he was pile-drived on top of the steel steps. I feel like Dustin started bleeding when QT hit Arn. He's just gonna bleed when anyone does anything. The newly healed group only stopped injuring Cody when Red Velvet came out to help, who was later taken out by Jade Cargill. I don't know why we keep writing off Cody, despite him pulling out emotional angles again and again and again. Again. I've personally really enjoyed QT's slow turn, but I know others haven't. I think this is going to change a lot of people's minds about that because it isn't about QT. It's about getting over a new trio of stars, which is very exciting. Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky cut a promo together ahead of their tag match on Elevation. It's great AEW are focusing on such young talent in the Nightmare War, but Ethan Page in particular here deserves a lot more. Another project of AEW's is the massive Cesar Bononi, getting a decent showing against Hang man page last week and now getting to go five minutes with John Moxley here, mostly thanks to his heel buddies of Ryan Nemeth and JD Drake interfering. Moxley won in a neat way of showing his isolation without Kingston. For now! Team Taz continues to be totally fine, Ricky Starks and Brian Cage don't hate each other, and then the inner circle made their brawling return. In an awesome backstage brawl, MJF opened the Pinnacle's locker room toilet to reveal their inner circle standing there, kicking off a fiery fist fight in the corridors where Hager put Wardlow through a massage table, Cash was thrown into an ice bath, Dax bladed hard, Dustin Rhodes probably did too at this point, and then Jericho gave a toilet swirly to MJF and then threw him through the vending machine glass in shades of his Shawn Michaels Geratron segment from 2008. The Super Elite then took on the Super Luchas of Pentagon, Phoenix and Laredo Kid in an awesome six-man tag. I'm not going to complain too much because the action was fantastic and it neatly furthered the Elite's feud with the Young Bucks who came out alongside Moxley after Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers had won. They'll have a six-man next week. But I don't know how many times I need to say this, it should have been Pentagon. Penta should really have his own storylines, not just be used as filler for other people's. We need a Lucha team over here, throw a Pentagon at it. Cody needs a two-week opponent over there, throw a Pentagon at it. He'll probably do a flip when I throw him. He's so much better than that, I genuinely believe he's AEW's most underutilized talent right now. The Bunny and Nyla Rose beat Ty Conti and Shida in a neat furthering of the Dark Order versus Big Money Matt faction. It's another example of AEW really focusing on nurturing young talent with Conti, who this match was built around, and also a holistic blending of the men's and women's divisions, where feuds now believably interweave between them. And with my feet on the air and my head on the ground, I lost my sports entertained mind at the Arcade Anarchy main event. The best friends versus the best men feud hasn't been great. It's been drawn out way too long, had repetitive segments, Trent got injured, but AEW often makes you forget all that by putting on an awesome climax match. It's how you leave them, folks. And just like the best friends versus Santana and Ortiz parking lot brawl last summer, this was a terrific match to close the show, with arcade gimmicks around the ring, including a whacker kip, a cuddly toy full of Lego bricks, and an air hockey table, which a returning Chris Statlander, who returned in a grab machine, put Penelope Ford through. But she wasn't the only return. CM Punk finally made his debut in AEW. April Fools to you, I April Fools to you again. No, it was far bigger. Trent's mum Sue came back. And also Trent. This was a really fun, chaotic return, and Trent brawled with Miro, allowing Chucky to win by putting Kip through the stage, meaning we got to close the show with the baby faces hugging in the ring. Statlander is now officially with the best friends, according to Cassidy on Twitter, doing thumbs ups to Trent's mum 
while playing Where Is My Mind by The Pixies. I love AEW for many reasons, but the biggest one is because it reminds me every Wednesday, without fail, that I love professional wrestling. What do you think of AEW Dynamite? Let me know in the comments down below and vote in our poll on a poll match on the community tab where 47% of you voted for CM Punk debuted, just beating out, ah uh, balls, it's April Fools, isn't it, at 53. April Fools to you again. Subscribe to our Wrestle Talk podcast channel for mine and Luke's full podcast review of AEW today. What's coming up, Luke? Arcade Anarchy! Click the video on the right now to watch our AEW review podcast. And there's been a WWE release behind the scenes. Click the Wrestle Talk news below that to find out what happened. I've been Mr. Davis. Jam that jam.